Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Of course, here at Martin. We've got a unique thing we're gonna do today. A lot of questions just in general about investing in biotech. Uh, I figured who better to ask than Martin with his kind of VC investing background. And so some great questions, you know, what do you look for in successful biotech companies? How do you spot them? You know, a little bit more in the DD process. So I figured we'd do a kind of cool video today and cover that. Uh, first things first, Martin, how are you? How was July 4th? It was good. Good. I'm happy to, to be back in the saddle and back at it. Yeah, good. Awesome. Well, uh, look, I guess let, let's dive into it. I mean, the most general question possible. Uh, what do you, slash, did you look for in successful biotech companies? Uh, do you want to kind of go through maybe some of those checklist items and we'll go from there? Yeah. So um, for those who are unfamiliar with my own background, I'm a recovering venture capitalist. Uh, I was with a firm called Osage University Partners for many years, uh, investing and starting primarily oncology companies. Uh, I have started a second company uh, with some colleagues called Presidia Biotherapeutics. Uh, that's a private company. Uh, and I'm an active angel investor uh, as well uh, in the biotech space. So let maybe break it down, Jason, in, into two areas. What I generally look for, and then if one is looking at public equities right now, what is different about today than maybe a, a year ago? So uh, for biotech, there's always kind of a, a standard checklist. Um, people often start with science. I tend to start with teams. Uh, so looking at the management team, do they have the right domain expertise? Uh, do they have repeat prior success in their careers? Are they supported by an appropriate board who also is well-connected uh, and has had prior success? You look for themes uh, within the team that support the prospect that they would be successful in this endeavor that, that you're investing in. Then we look at uh, the products. Uh, does the science support what they're doing? Is there a suitable end-use market for that opportunity? And does their intellectual property, uh, which is super important for what we do, protect uh, that product uh, that they're developing in that market they want to exploit that product in? Uh, and then lastly, for me, I, I, you know, the old MBA adage, it's the, the people, products, and process. Do they have the processes in place uh, to succeed? And so you need a well operating company. That means on the GNA side, having appropriate legal and, and re regulatory uh, and financial support. And then on the R&D side, the right project management to make sure that you're actually following the timelines and milestones that you want to achieve as a, a company. So that's when you look at biotech as a whole. The public biotech markets uh, are in a whole different place today in July of 2022 than maybe they have ever been historically. We're currently in the longest drawdown period uh, in the, the history of, of biotech. Uh, and many people believe that we are currently in a recession uh, as well. And so biotech companies by and large in the small and, and micro cap and even mid cap stage are non-revenue generating. Uh, so right now, cash is king. Do companies have appropriate cash reserves to operate for a long period of time? Or are they going to need to do a financing in the near future? And given where the equity markets currently stand, that could be a significantly dilutive financing for investors. So you have all the standard criteria, and then you really need to look at the cash, cash position for public equities at the moment. Yeah, no, interesting. Uh, you know, one of the points that came up uh, was how important is a team that's gone through or having a CEO, more importantly, that's gone through the FDA process before and, you know, taking a drug, you know, from wherever to, you know, through the FDA and approval. Um, does that cross your, your checklist as much as maybe other things? And where, you know, I don't know if it's possible, like what, how high would you rank that um, perhaps? I, I think you'd get a variety of answers from, from folks. I will say my view has always been that the CEO's role at a company is to drive strategy, operational excellence, and fundraising. And then anything beyond that is supported by the team. So something like regulatory, you want an expert in that. Uh, the CEO should not be driving regulatory strategy because 
That's a very complicated world. It's also a world where the FDA just does change regulations over time. And so we have internal support through a regulatory team and then, uh, or you know, companies build those regulatory teams uh, as well as consultancies. And so you have individual contractors out there as well as well-known contract research organizations that will provide you a full suite of regulatory services. So I think the, the key point, Jason, is you need regulatory support. It does not necessarily have to come from the CEO. Got it. No, it makes a lot of sense. You, you can uh, find someone, uh, if the CEO isn't that perfect person, you can obviously find someone um, that is probably, or like you said, services and companies that have done tons of them. So it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. that uh, maybe not as high on the on the list as some, some other people would put it. Um, you, you talk about public versus private. You haven't really, you know, what would you look for in a, in a private, you know, kind of biotech um you know, in today's world, obviously July of 2022, uh, where markets are a little shaky and, you know, even the private markets are a little shaky. Curious yeah. what, curious what you'd be looking differently in the private side. Yeah, I, I think what, what people are, are looking for, and I'll speak for myself, are companies that need modest amounts of, of cash to operate for a three-year period. Now, modest may be $40 million, so it's, it's not insignificant. Uh, but, but cash amounts that can be split between a handful of investors <clears throat> and provides a significant runway for the company to operate. I also look for companies right now that have either multiple assets in their pipeline or a platform that can spin off assets so that if they need to bring in additional cash, they can do it potentially in a non dilutive manner through a pharma partnership, a grant, et cetera. So it's all about managing the cash reserves uh, and then finding ways to bring in incremental cash to the companies without it being massively dilutive. Yeah, no, it may, makes sense. Um, you know, some, some other questions, you know, of course, you know, biotech, the, the sector's massive. Is there any like kind of, you know, subsections of biotech that, you know, maybe today you'd be looking at more than others? You know, you talk about, you know, these platforms that are, they can spin off a ton of things, um, you know, versus <clears throat> some drugs that are very niche, like just curious on, on any of those from a selection criteria. Is there like general sectors within biotech or sections you're, you're looking at? Yeah, I, I think there's kind of two areas I think are intriguing right now. One, and in full candor, my company does have a program in this area, which is a bispecific antibody. So that's an area that's been around for 20 years. <clears throat> Genentech had a, a patent that really made it very hard for smaller companies to enter into that space. And that patent recently expired to enable us and many others to exploit this technological platform for antibody targeting. And we use it to bind to a cancer cell and an immune cell to activate that immune cell to kill the cancer cell. So I think by specifics will grow massively over time. The other area that I, in full candor, comes in and out of vogue is regenerative medicine. I think some of the things that particularly Vertex Pharmaceuticals is doing around type one diabetes uh, and pancreatic islet cell transplants or regeneration, uh, I think are fascinating. Uh, and I could see that as an area that will grow over time. Uh, and that contrasts with areas like gene therapy, which are very, very challenging right now. The costs keep going up. Uh, COVID's been very painful from a patient recruitment standpoint. Uh, so there's just a lot of headwinds in, in that area in particular. So you try to find the areas where you know, in some sense, the path of least resistance while still having significant uh, upside from a market potential standpoint. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the, to take this a uh, step further, you know, you mentioned, of course, markets, and we, we talk about all the time, markets are terrible, find companies with cash. Um, you know, in that kind of perspective, uh, I mean, would you of the mindset, hey, the, there's a dip where, you know, things are much cheaper than they've ever been. We're, you know, in a huge downswing. Uh, would you be looking at maybe, you know, starting some positions in certain companies right now because of how down things are, or just curious, like general market conditions, of course, all the, uh, you know, all the disclaimers of this is an investment advice is just personal. Uh, curious what your view is. Yeah. Uh, the personal is I don't know. Um, Inflation is not something that anyone in our generation or frankly, even the prior generation 
had to deal with. And so it's very hard to prognosticate when no one has any firsthand knowledge of what that means. Um, and certainly inflation hurts growth stories, whether it's biotech, crypto, mining, tech, you name it. Um, biotech in particular has been interesting the last few weeks. The primary index, the XBI, is up 35% over that time. And some people are calling sector rotation. Others are saying that you just had so many shorts in place that a little bit of market movement puts pressure on the shorts and the market can very quickly turn around and get to 35%. What I don't see right now is broad support for the market. So the idea that that 35% is gonna hold or grow over the duration of the summer, could that be the case? Absolutely. Uh, but I failed to see a rationale as to why that would actually be the case. And so for me, and I think many people right now, you're looking at individual stories uh, at the moment. Uh, and then, you know, despite never should you do this, you know, try to catch a falling knife, people are trying to time the bottom for biotech and, and when they should rotate in to things like the broader indices. Um, so I don't know if we're at, at the bottom. Feels like we got to be darn close. It also feels like tech has a way to go. And if tech has a way to go, could that be a negative feedback loop on biotech? Maybe. So I think a lot of people are just waiting and waiting to see what happens, particularly with Q2 earnings. You mentioned a good uh, good point, you know, like timing the market and a lot of people, you know, that are trying to do that. Um, you know, maybe from the, you know, your, your background, you know, what is the best way to, to grow a position and say, you know, I'm in love with a company, um, you know, uh, a lot, and I know there's no set answer, but is it, Hey, I should just buy and, and go away. Should I buy over six months? You know, Hey, if I'm, if I like this story, I like, you know, I like what's happening. There's you know a decent amount of cash in this company. Is it, Hey, just start growing a position over, over months, over a year. Curious on, on kind of how you enter the market in today's kind of, you know, world. I, I will say the historical way I did it, um, totally broke down over the last year with biotech. I Just none of us have ever experienced such a broad and aggressive market sell-off. Uh, and I think things like algos and, and quants and leverage accelerate that. And so the market's totally overshot. Um, I think most people would advise you dollar cost in over time, uh, typically over a six to 12 month period. The challenge with biotech, particularly for non-revenue generating, is if you dollar cost in over a course of a year, by the end of that year, you really do need to reevaluate the investment because that company's prospects may have fundamentally changed. So biotech, I think in particular, is a much more active area of investment. There are, are certainly, I would say, companies maybe over a billion dollar market cap where you can dollar cost in over a long period of time. And that can be a very long hold because you're, you're really looking for you know, more steady growth versus, you know, the more venture capital type of returns, the high beta investments that are sub billion dollar market cap that you're, you know, looking for that one big win to wash out all the losses that you will almost certainly face yeah. uh, in emerging companies. Yeah, question. And, uh, you know, this came up, I, I, it's probably a little bit of apples to oranges, but maybe there's mm -hmm. some similarities. Um, someone asked, uh, you know, you're still seeing some bigger, you know, pharma companies making acquisitions. Um, they, they used an example. There was one a, a month or so ago um, where Pfizer bought a migraine drug. Um, what would be your take? Hey, Pfizer makes a big acquisition in the migraine space. Is that good? And the interesting question, is that good or bad for other companies that are trying to support a migraine drug? It's hard to know. And so Pfizer spent a little bit over $11 billion um, uh, for that company. And, you know, the drug that's marketed, Nurtec, is a wonderful drug. Uh, so, you know, that is a one-off. That's a tremendous outcome for Biohaven and their, their shareholders. Um, but I think overall, more M&A is, is always welcome. Uh, in the biotech space, there was a recent publication by Ernst & Young uh, where they believe uh, that large pharma has a little bit over a trillion dollars of capital at their disposal for M&A. Uh, does that mean they'll use it? 
Um, no, uh, they also, based on EMI's estimate, can't deploy more than $110 billion for share buybacks. So you got to use that money in some way, theoretically. Now, on the flip side, you have companies like Apple that have tremendous amounts of cash and have not done much with it besides buyback. So just because they have money doesn't necessarily mean they will do anything with it. One of the hesitations, though, has been that valuations for biotech stocks in 2019 through 21 were so high that pharma was reluctant to pay a premium to what they believed to be a bloated stock price. Well, now valuations are way down uh, and probably below where they should be. And so will that stimulate pharma interest to do deals? I sure hope so. I think that's good for the uh, ecosystem and certainly we'll look to see that, that pick up over the course of the year. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, pulling the question of, hey, you've got 10 drugs that, that are in the running to, you know, have this superior migraine drug. Of course, the dream of a lot of these guys is get acquired by Pfizer and Pfizer picks one. Um, you know, does that make the other nine less or more valuable was kind of interesting, you know, question based on, you know, just where they were coming from. I, I agree. Right. It's kind of like apples to oranges in some ways, but I agree with you that, you know, it does improve the ecosystem for sure. And my, migraine, there's, there's no cure, right? So Nurtech, the, the drug that they were referring to from Biohaven, works for some people, not all. And even those that it works for, it does not work for most people forever. For most people, it just works for a couple of months. So you will uh, see a reversion to the mean from a re response standpoint, and people will need to switch on, on drugs. So there's always going to be a need for new drugs in the migraine space. Um, but this, this deal doesn't mean that it's going to be easier or harder to develop a, a migraine drug. It just says what Pfizer valued that particular drug for, which is probably good for anyone developing a migraine drug right now. Yeah. Oh, interesting. A good angle. Well, look, uh, that was, you know, most of my questions, you know, there's a lot of questions around, you know, what else is on your checklist? You know, I've obviously you really pounded the table on team, team, team. Uh, is there anything else that maybe you wanted to squeeze into kind of what's a part of your DD process? No, I think it was pretty comprehensive, right? So, you know, it's biology, chemistry, and then GNA, people, finance, uh, and, and legal. Uh, and if you can do diligence in those areas and feel comfortable with investment, and it ties into a company that has appropriate cash reserves currently, or the financing that you're participating in gets them to that point, then that starts getting into that bucket of interesting opportunities. And then hopefully you're looking at enough of those interesting opportunities that you can pick the one uh, that is the, the most interesting so you don't run the risk of adverse selection. Yeah. No, oh, awesome. Cool. Well, then we'll leave it. A, you know, the last question that came up was just, um, you know, drugs that are blockbusters versus drugs that are, you know, niche. I'm curious on, you know, what your view is. Does the strategy change at all between those? Um, you know, any, any comments on that? There, there, it, well, it depends on a lot of different factors. <laughs> um, but ultimately, right, it's an NPV analysis. So if the market potential is huge, usually there's a huge discount rate uh, to get back to what the value is today. But you know, usually that value is more than something is niche. So for that niche opportunity, you have to have a higher probability of success that it works uh, to increase the MPV. And then uh, you also have to spend less money on it, right? So to get to the return that you're looking for, niche, you need to spend less money, have a higher probability of success. The blockbuster area, you can uh, have the luxury of swinging for the fence uh, to get to a similar valuation comparison. Yeah. No, interesting. Well, great comparable. Look, uh, Martin, really appreciate it. I think a lot of people were kind of saying you have a super unique background in this space and they'd love, uh, you know, I, I think I speak for a lot of them, appreciate you taking the time and, and answering some of those questions. Um, again, want to always uh, remind people if you've got questions, drop them below. You know, Martin and I do talk often and we'll make sure to get your question in a, in, a, in a video coming here soon. Martin, anything else you want to say before we hop off? No, thanks for everyone for the questions. Keep them coming and keep your eye on Context Therapeutics. There you go. Awesome. Well, Martin, we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks.